Amita, you can start now. Hi, Amita, I think you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. No, still not audible. Uh, hope I'm audible. Yes. Yes. You can hear you now. Uh, very good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the research program conducted by the Sabragam University of Sri Lanka. Uh, am I good enough? The audio is. Um... What about now? Okay, okay thank so you. Is... Very yes. even, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the research program conducted by the Sabragam University of Sri Lanka. There's a lot of lag. Uh, Miss Amita, in I think association you should try with your camera. Emerald Publishing and the Gulf Medical University UAE. This is the 14th webinar of the Writing Impactful Research Program. With a great respect, let me first welcome the main speaker of the session, Professor Shanti Gopal Krishnan, editor in chief of the South Asian Journal of Business Studies. Today, today she is discussing on the navigating the publishing. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, you can continue. Okay, sure. Uh, is, is it okay now? Can you all hear me? I'm sorry. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. We can yeah, hear yeah. you. Better, better. We can hear you. Hello. Am I able to hear you? Uh, yes, we Hello? can hear you. Please continue. We can hear Hello? you. Okay, right. And uh, with a great respect, let me first welcome the main speaker of the session, Professor Shanti Gopal Krishnan, <laughs> editor in chief of the South Asian Journal of Business Studies. The publishing process in Germany. Let me also welcome Professor Adam, Professor Tulan Afali, Dean of Factual Management Studies, Sargamo University of Sri Lanka. Professor Emil Maslam, Chairman of Research and Publication Unit of Faculty of Management Studies, Sargamo University of Sri Lanka. In gratitude, let me welcome our regional coordinators of this webinar, Dr. Jayanthen Devasiri, Senior Lecturer, Sargamo University of Sri Lanka, Ms. Amita Amina, Publishing Relationship Manager, Emerald Publishing, Professor Sudhir Rana, Gulf Medical University, and Professor Kashif Zaid, Gift University of Pakistan. In fact, they supported a lot in making this program a great success. Then, with the gratitude, let me also welcome Ms. Disha Lakanpal, Region Manager, Emerald Publishing Group. Then, with a great respect, I would like to welcome all the distinguished participants from Emerald Publishing, Gulf Medical University, and the Sabragamu University of Sri Lanka. Then, with gratitude, we all welcome the respected audience, mainly our academics from all the universities worldwide, senior professors, professors, senior lecturers, lecturers, students, and researchers are welcome to the program for making the session lively. Further, I would like to welcome the media partners of the program, Sunday Observer and Sunday Times Sri Lanka. At last, but not least, I would like to introduce the main speaker of the program today. She is Professor Shanti Gopal Krishnan. She completed her undergraduate and graduate work in India and worked with the consumer durable company. She obtained her PhD at Rutgers University, and she is currently a professor at the Martin Tajman School of Management. 
She also the editor in chief of the South Asian Journal of Business Studies and serves on editorial boards of se uh, several journals. So thank you so much, ma'am. It's over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dr. J. Rana, for giving me this opportunity to be with you and to present. Uh, Disha, I have a small question. I want to move it to my other, I want to move the projection to the second screen. Is there a way I can do it? Or because I, I have two screens. Or do um, I need to move this to the... Yeah, you, you might have to join in from the other screen. Oh, so there is no way to move this to the other screen? To the other screen, yes, ma'am. Not that I know of, I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, but Professor Shanti, you're visible to us and whatever you're showing is also visible to us. So can you see my, can you see the PowerPoints or you, you can only see the, my. No, I can, we can see your, uh, we can actually only see your uh, uh, email. Yeah. Yes. So we don't want to see the email screen, so. <laughs> Okay, so yes, uh, we can see your presentation now. Okay, so let me just shut the other screen. Um, okay, so you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Now. Yes. Oh, uh, put it okay. on the the presentation mode. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to put it on the presentation one now. So is that good? Are you still? Am I perfect. good enough? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, thank you all. And um, again, and I'm going to try, um, as I was telling, Dr. Jayantha, it's uh, hard for me to be giving you words of wisdom for an hour. I will try, albeit. Uh, so I guess I'm going to talk to you today about the process of publishing. And essentially, a lot, all of us wear many hats. And to some extent, I think to understand publishing is to understand the many hats that we wear. So I'm a professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. I've been a professor for almost 30 years now. But in academics, when we get into academics, the process of succeeding academics involves um, making tenure, getting promoted. And an integral part of that is getting to understand how to publish and sort of ex implementing a successful publishing agenda. So part of being an academic is also to be a successful author. And much of what I'm going to talk to you is about how can we get to be a successful author. Besides that, we also wear other hats. In order to understand the uh, getting published and how to be an author, we also have to sort of contribute to the publishing process which is what we need to do through being a reviewer. So once you are a reviewer, you also understand what happens on the other side. So you're not impatient. You don't get uh, unnecessarily crushed when you're given a major revision because you know that that is the standard procedure of what it takes to get published. And lastly, in the last five years, I've been wearing the hat of editor in chief for the South Asian Journal of Business Studies. And so you see publishing from a completely different viewpoint. So I'm going to also share some of my insights of what it takes to be an editor, because as an editor, it is your task to raise the profile of the journal, to make it more prestigious to publish in the journal, and to raise the sort of credibility of the journal. So largely, we are playing the role of kind of a gatekeeper to the journal. And so the more exclusive a journal gets over time, your published work in that journal is better appreciated and seems more credible. 
and also gets cited more. So essentially today I'm gonna to talk to you about the four hats we wear, you know, and, and mostly as an author, a reviewer, and an editor in chief. So I'm gonna do this presentation in oh I'm going in four parts. Uh, so firstly, I'm going to introduce you to my journal, which is uh, an Emerald journal. So thank you, uh, Emerald, for sponsoring this webinar series. Uh, the journal is called the South Asian Journal of Business Studies. This journal has been around for about 10 years. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the journal. Part two is the task that I was assigned to do, which is understanding the submission, review, and decision-making process from inside the journal. Part three is your roles as authors. So how is it that you can become a successful author is partly how you manage your relationship with the reviewers, the editor, and how can you better do it? And lastly, I'm going to close by giving you some general tips for publishing because our ultimate goal is to become successful authors who have a very good record of success in terms of the percentage of journal, uh, articles that get published relative to what you submit. So it is, a, it is a very sort of, it is a steep learning curve and all of us sort of start at a place where we are freshly minted PhDs and we need to start publishing. So the learning curve is steep, but it gets better. The more you get published, the easier it gets. And so it is something that is worth investing time early on. So I'm gonna start by introducing you to the South Asian Journal of Business Studies. So Emerald uh, has a lot of good journals and I want to uh, sort of classify ourselves as one of those good journals. Uh, and our focus is primarily in the emerging economies of South Asia. Different journals have different foci. And ours is kind of a multidisciplinary journal. It covers a wide swath of areas. So it's not just management. Although I come from the management discipline, my research is in management. This journal covers more than just the management areas. So we do entrepreneurship. We do global and social responsibility, which is partly in keeping with what Emerald is trying to sort of promote more recently. We talk about business development issues in emerging economies, marketing, finance, economics, trade, accounting. So the journal actually covers many areas that are outside my basic area of expertise. It is ranked by the Australian Business Dean's Council. It is also ranked by Scopus, and it's a completely digital uh, journal. In September, we will be publishing the third issue of volume 10. So we've been publishing this journal for 10 years. It's a relatively young journal, if you look at uh, journals, because some, of, some journals have been around for 50, 60 years. So this is a relatively young journal, but it's managed to establish itself and show that it's moving in an upward direction, which is very important for a journal to become more credible in the eyes of both the readers and authors. So what exactly is South Asian Journal of Business Studies? The main sort of niche for this journal is that it is South Asia focused. What is South Asia? So South Asia includes countries which are we don't receive as many manuscripts and so we haven't published as many that are Nepal and Bhutan focused. But this is one of the primary ways that this journal defines who it is. 
So it publishes all business issues related to this region in the world. And this region in the world is becoming increasingly important, more because of the development of the region relative to the rest of the world, also because academics in this part of the world is becoming much more like Western academics. Publishing is becoming important. And therefore we have, this journal sort of provides a vehicle for people to publish their research. Research in the area not only replicates Western research, but also has a lot of phenomena that is unique to this part of the world, purely because of its history and the unique systems that exist in this part of the world. So the South Asian Journal provides a vehicle to sort of showcase that kind of research. So why, I'm also going to give a little bit of a marketing push for the journal because it's always good to do that when you're with an audience like this, because a lot of you are looking to publish. So why publish with the South Asian Journal of Business Studies? I say there are four reasons. One is our editorial team. Two, the process by which we sort of develop journals is very, uh, we develop manuscripts is very developmental. We provide, we try and sort of shepherd a manuscript through the process. We do well in a competitive landscape. If you look at us on a competitive landscape, we are doing well and we are getting better. And we have a fairly transparent acceptance criteria. So let's start with the editorial team. Um, I have more than, so I'm the editor in chief. I have been the editor in chief since uh, 2016. I have more than 20 years experience in teaching and research. I think I first published my first article in 1998, probably, uh, uh, no, 1992, um, I'd say 1992. So it's a long time ago. And I have continued to publish over the years. And what I've learned is that as I told you before, publishing is a very iterative process. So you continue to publish just because you've become an editor, you don't stop publishing because you have to keep in touch with the field. So I think I continue to publish and I've continued to work with PhD students to continue publishing. Also, we have an extremely talented group of faculty and researchers that help us as associate editors. And they are located all over the globe. One of the things I've realized after being an editor is it is important to have the perspective of researchers all over the globe. So we have associate editors from Australia. We have associate editors from Europe, both the UK and the Netherlands. We have associate editors from India and Pakistan and several that are based in the United States just because I ha my network happens to be a little stronger here. Also, we have a fairly extensive panel of reviewers. We constantly look at the reviewers, prune our reviewers, add new reviewers, because we need reviewers that are responsive. Reviewing is really the lifeblood of a journal. How efficient the journal is, how well it does its task, largely depends on how good the reviewers are and how quickly they turn around manuscripts sent to them and who, how good the quality of reviews is. So I'm going to quickly show you our editorial team. This is the journal uh, web page. Uh, and here is the editorial team. Our founding, I don't know if you can see this, but this font may be a little small, but you can also go back and look at the, uh, uh, the web page. The founding editor was Shaista Kilji from the American University in DC. I have been, I'm only the second editor of this journal. As I told you, we have 10 associate editors located all over the globe. Uh, and then we have what's called an editorial review board. So we have two people or three people in Emerald that exclusively help us. So we have a, a person that helps us while the manuscript is in process. And we have a person help us once the manuscript is accepted. Again, our editorial board is carefully pruned. These are our very senior reviewers. And in many cases, we try and allocate the paper 
when we allocate a paper, we try and at least find one member of the editorial board come in as a reviewer. So we have an experienced reviewer look at the paper in addition to perhaps one of the other reviewers, because we have a fairly extensive, I think we have over 600 reviewers. Many of these reviewers are previous uh, accepted authors whose papers have been published in the journal. They are people that have volunteered and have published in other journals, but basically they've had the experience of publishing and know what is the response that authors need when they are looking to get published. So moving on, what is the acceptance criteria for the South Asian Journal of Business Studies? We basically publish two kinds of papers. One is uh, largely we publish empirical studies and empirical studies are data-based studies and the data can come from many sources. We uh, publish secondary data-based studies. A lot of the finance and economic studies, economic studies are based from secondary data sets. At the same time, I have to say empirical studies are not reports because often we get uh, papers that seem like reports where they just produce graphs from the data, but no original research question is answered through the paper. We also publish sort of survey-based data, which is common in marketing, organization theory, organization management, strategy. We publish qualitative case-based research. Recently, in the last two years in this journal, I have ex uh, instituted what is called an executive insight series, which are short pieces that are interview or insight-based. In the last issue, we published something on how India was handling the COVID crisis, particularly with the, this was very early in the COVID crisis where Kerala had some very interesting and innovative mechanisms to handle the COVID crisis. We've also published interview South Asian uh, based CEOs globally, and we've published interview based studies with them that offer sort of insights for leadership and management. As I told you earlier, one of the key sort of niches of this journal is it's South Asia based. And these are the seven countries, uh, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Bhutan, Nepal, Maldives, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Those are the seven countries that constitute South Asia. What is interesting is I said that part of the editor's job is to build the credibility of the journal. When I took over this journal in 2016, we were typically scrambling to get papers accepted to publish in the next issue. And we were getting about 200 papers submitted per year. Our acceptance rate was somewhere in the 12 to 15% range. As the years have progressed, it is probably because the publishing has become more important in South Asia. So a lot more of the South Asian authors publish, probably because of the name of the journal has gotten around. So we are getting a lot more submissions today, but the number of papers we publish hasn't increased. So we still publish about, as until this year, we have still published only about 20 papers a year. So our acceptance rate has fallen from about 12 to 15% to about six to 8%. So in a sense, if you have published in this journal, you're now a part of a more exclusive club. And it, from the looks of it, it looks like it is going to get more and more exclusive if we manage the gatekeeping efficiently. So the question is, what happens when a paper is submitted? So on, so one of the things is I was, I'm sometimes amused. I get a let, you know, notes from the author saying it is two weeks, three weeks since I've submitted my paper, when is the paper going to get accepted? And when is it going to be published? The bottom line is the prestige of the journal is that all of these journals are double blind reviewed. So on average, it takes about six to eight months from the time you submit the paper to the time the paper gets eventually accepted. Interestingly enough, the South Asian Journal of Business Studies now, we get about 400 to 450 uh, submissions annually. 
this year we've already received about 260 submissions as of end of last week and one of the things that i have started to do in order to make the review process more efficient and to keep reviewers engaged and willing to review for us i have increased the extent to which i desk reject so i have raised the desk rejection almost to 55 percent so if we get about say 450 papers more than i i'd say this year we i'm targeting we probably end up getting about 500 papers so more than 272 to 280 papers are going to get desk rejected so that's a pretty large number of papers and the other thing is because more of you more of you are submitting to the journal because our review process has become more efficient there is a longer wait time from the time the paper gets accepted the time that it gets published so one of the things that we have done to alleviate the wait time is starting 21 22 that is volume 11 we are going to increase the number of papers that we publish to 24 papers in an issue but what is interesting is as of now i have almost 40 papers that i have accepted and are waiting to get published so what emerald does and they're very efficient about it is they have what's called the early site in the journal so once the paper gets accepted it is of the abstract and the paper is available through the early site process and for authors to access and use the research. So just because it's not published, you're not losing out because your research is available once it's accepted. But it's in fact the more like the more prestige the more prestigious journals, the wait time happens to be longer. So in a sense, it makes it uh, it's better for you because. A, other authors and researchers can access your research and the credibility of the, your outlet is increasing as it goes in time. So now, as of now, it takes almost a year to get seen, in an, to have an issue number and pages once the paper gets accepted. And that has happened because we are doing a better job in attracting submissions and because we're doing a better job in getting better submissions. So. One of, as I said, it is not just because the wait time has increased, it doesn't mean us we are accepting more papers. In fact, our acceptance rate has come down. So it's come down from 12 to 15 percent to six to eight percent. So it is because our submissions are increasing and we raised the bar for what we accept. The journal has in fact become better and it takes longer for you to get published and it's becoming a little more harder to get accepted because we've raised the quality bar. And I think that's a good journey for, for a journal and it's a good place for a journal to be in. So how do we really, so basically how does this whole process happen? It's a fairly tedious, tedious process, but it's a very meticulous and transparent process. So we have Manuscript Central through which you publish. Sometimes authors get sort of, um, impatient and they just want to email me the papers but it's i'm dealing with 500 papers and this is not my main job this is something that i volunteer to do i have an editorial assistant but it everything has to be submitted through scholar one and manuscript central which is the portal that emerald has for this journal so once the journal once the paper manuscript is submitted it is dedicated it is a i decide whether it is eligible to be reviewed because i don't want to overburden my associate editors so as i said i desk reject about 55 percent of the papers so once it is decided sometimes we unsubmit certain manuscripts because they don't follow format which i'll talk to you a little bit about later but once the paper is okay we assign it to the aes and the AEs are experts in their field. So sometimes they might decide that the paper does not have enough of an original contribution. So they might again desk reject, but they sort of evaluate the paper for relevance, language, authenticity, whether it's actually original, 
and what the paper actually contributes. Because eventually the amount of space we have as a journal is quite limited. And we want to make sure that everything we publish makes a serious contribution to the literature in South Asia. Typically, the papers go through, in our journal, I would say, if it's a very experienced author, two iterations. And for a more novice author, it might go through three or four iterations. In some rare cases, it might go through five revisions. But how long it takes also depends on how cooperative the author is in being, to, in being able to turn around manuscripts in the time that's given to them. We typically give them, we typically give authors about one month or 45 days for the first major revision and then perhaps one month for the next revision. You can always ask us for extensions, but, and we are happy to give extensions because you know we, we are willing to accommodate authors. And I think part of the process is being able to work with authors. And the final decision after say two or three iterations of the manuscript is made by the editor in chief along with the AEs and the review, uh, what the review recommendations, reviewer recommendations are for the journal, for the manuscript, I'm sorry. So moving on, we're gonna talk a little bit about how journals are evaluated. So we're gonna talk about the competitive landscape of journals. So there are thousands of journals. I mean, as you know, I think uh, uh, there was a conversation early on uh, with one of the other editors, what I realized was that part of it is A, you need to establish yourself in the field, both among other researchers and authors, and you have to make it attractive to publish in the journal. So how are journals evaluated? So for example, we, uh, we have the Tokyo Olympics, we evaluate athletes by the, you know, by their quality, how they do in their sort of national, for their local sort of team, their national team, so that are they the best to put forward internationally? Similarly, the journal uh, field is also extremely competitive, and there are many, many rating agencies that try to objectively evaluate journals. So the first thing is everybody that wants to, most authors that submit to the journal say, hey, are you rated by ABDC, which is the Australian Business Dean's Council rating? Are you rated by Scopus? And Scopus, it takes Scopus at least five, you have to be in existence for five years because they have to look at certain journal statistics before the, they can rate you. So authors are very selective. So they ask you, are you rated by ABDC? Are you rated by Scopus? And the ultimate rating, uh, the rating that you can get is what is called JCR, Journal Citation Reports. And they provide impact factors and rankings. I'm gonna talk a little bit about these different ranking schema so that you get a sense because we also have to pick and select our journals. And how we select our journals depend on A, what stage of our careers we are in. It also depends on what is the quality of a manuscript and reasonably, where do you think it can get published? So SEJBS has sort of moved up in the last five years. I take some of the credit, but a lot of the credit goes to our associate editors, the team at Emerald that has worked with us and our incredible uh, group of reviewers that have helped the process because part of it is authors think that we are credible when we can turn around manuscripts. So when they get good reviews in reasonable amount of time, but authors also get impatient. They submit it and in three weeks, they want the reviews back. It takes us, we get, we get 50, 60 manuscripts a week. And so it takes us about two weeks to get to your manuscript to see whether it's worth assigning to an AE. And the fact that we have now been accepted into Scopus and the Emerging Journal Citation Index has raised the credibility. What is also interesting is when we were accepted into Scopus in 2019, we had a site score of 1.7. 
We have almost doubled it to 3.2 in 2020, and we have still retained the score of 3.2 this year. So in other words, the papers that are being published in SAJBS are being uh, seen, downloaded, used, and cited by other researchers working on topics related to the topics that we publish. So the amount of downloads of SAJBS journals, uh, journal papers have increased and continue to increase with every year. So one of the things is that as your ratings in Scopus and ABDC are either stable or increase, the credibility of the journal significantly goes up in the eyes of both authors and other people that read the journal researchers. So one of the things that we have done consistently in the South Asian Journal of Business Studies since I have taken over as editor is we have had special issues. So what do special issues do? One is it focuses on a topic that is relevant to the region, and it also sort of publishes a collection of papers that are uh, relevant to a particular topic. So the two most recent special issues, the way I have done it as an editor is every year, the last issue of the year is devoted to a special issue. And we started this practice only in 2019 because it took me a year or two to get adjusted to being the editor and to find people to edit special issues. So I inherited a special issue on South Asian leadership from my previous editor. But since I have been the editor in 2019, we did a special issue on innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship in South Asia. In 2020, we had an extremely successful special issue on work family balance issues in South Asia and how South Asian countries are dealing with it. This year, we are combining two special issues. One is based on the Indian Academy of Management. We devoted a special issue to the Indian Academy of Management papers that were presented in 2019. They had an extremely successful conference in IIM Trichy. They had over 600 submissions. They invited about 20 papers, and four of them are going to be published in the September issue of um, SAJBS. The September special issue, uh, issue is going to consist of two special issues that have been grouped together, one on the social media, new social media marketing strategies. So one of the things that I have done as the editor of this journal is also sort of varied the areas where special issues have been invited. In 2022, we have two special issues, one on positive organizational scholarship. The guest editor for this special issue is uh, Drs. Ashish Pandey from IIT Bombay and Dharam Bhavik. We also have a special issue on corporate innovations in response to the COVID-19 crisis, and that has been headed by Dr. Muturaj Bresnev and Dr. Joanne Silito. And we are doing something on the role of technology in e-commerce, the bright and the dark side, which is the main guest editor is Dr. Abhishek Bale. I believe he's also in India, IIT Bombay. So part of doing the special issues is A, it increases the visibility of the journal. Two, authors that get published, A, they have a quicker turnaround time because the special issues close at a finite timeline and then they're processed and published. Three, they're more likely to be cited because uh, future authors looking for research on a particular area might find a concentration of published work within a special issue. So the special issues have worked well for SAJBS and it's also increased the number of papers we have in the pipeline. And that is one of the things that has helped us sort of have a better and more healthy, robust pipeline of papers that we're looking to publish. So that is my spiel about the South Asian Journal of Business Studies. I'm hoping that a lot of you will think of submitting your work to the journal and a lot more of you who are sort of interested will join the reviewing team and sort of become part of the reviewing team and sort of review consistently because reviewing actually helps you understand what it takes to publish from the inside. So. I'm going to 
move to part two of my presentation, which is understanding the submission, review, and decision-making process. Um, please sort of think of questions you want to ask either about the journal or about any part of the presentation and uh, you know, send it in to the panel so that I'm happy to answer any questions. So the first thing about publishing is how do you choose the journal? And as I told you, it's a very competitive landscape and journals are ranked by multiple systems. And I told you three of the systems and I'm going to add the fourth system. So the FT50 is the top 50 business journals ranked by Financial Times. Now these are the most exclusive journals, be it finance, management, marketing. And these journals sort of are churned. So if they don't meet a certain impact factor, they are out of the FT50. So it, new journals get in, old journals, which, which are sort of not meeting the standards, get out. So it's, there's a constant churn. Of course, some of these sort of really established journals within each discipline have consistently stayed at the FT50. Second is the ABDC ranking. And I have, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ABDC in the next slide and the JCR, which is the Journal Citation Rate Impact Factor and the Scopus Score. So we all want to publish in top journals. But the thing is, it is extremely hard to publish in top journals. There is an extremely high reject rate, but these also have very high impact factors. So the more you publish in top journals, the better you're going to get known, and the more your research is going to get cited by other work, other people working in the area. So I've just picked a couple of, so one of Emerald's top journals in our area is International Journal of, Journal of International Business Studies, also known as JIBS, which is on the FT50, and an ABDC A-star. So I've picked sort of what are ABDC, so AMJ, Academy of Management Journal, the impact factor is 10.84. It's one of the highest impact factors. The only others that have a higher impact factor is probably Administrative Science Quarterly, also known as ASQ. Journal of Management and Journal of Management Studies, both are A-stars. Both of them are on the FT50 list. It is not that all A-star journals are on the FT50 list, but some of the top A-star journals are on the FT50 list. Then we have the A journals, which are, I've just picked a sum. I've almost picked the journals that I have published in because I'm sort of very aware of the impact factors of those journals. Industrial marketing management has a, um, across, and I picked them across different publishers. So we have Sage journals, Academy of Management journals, Emerald journals. So uh, industrial marketing management and journal of business research have fairly high impact factors, but they're not A-star journals. They're only A journals. And SAJBS, I think, is a fantastic journal. I feel our site scores have gone up. We are aspiring. We think we have everything that it takes to go from a C to a B. So the rise as a journal is very, very incremental. You have to work very hard behind the scenes to make the journal get ranked higher. So I have realized that last time we almost made it, but not quite. And so they were looking for a higher impact factor they were looking for a higher impact factor and they also looked for ranking by Scopus to show an upward trend. And this time I think we've been able to more demonstrably show it. So picking a journal is important. And I would say that you can start with the best that you think is possibly uh, where your paper can get published. Sometimes you'd like to start with a management science or an AMJ, but you get a very quick desk rejection. And then you go down the list and sometimes it is finding the right home for the paper. You should never give up hope and you have to keep sort of reorienting the piece and trying different journals that where your paper might fit the scope of the journal. And it's very, very important to find where the right fit is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the two other sort of rank, just very briefly about the two other ranking um, agencies and then move on. So the Australian Business Dean's Council ranking system is one of the most extensive. It ranks almost 2,700 journals across a variety of business fields. 
management, entrepreneurship, marketing, finance, accounting, logistics, supply chain, tourism management, hospitality management. Like if you look at their A star, almost 200 journals or about 7.4% of journals that they rank are ranked A star, but only one quarter of their A star journals feature in the FT50. So if you look at the FT50, it's a very, very exclusive club of journals. There are A journals, which are not easy. I can tell you I published in these A journals and I've also got rejected by these A journals. They're not easy, but there are 651 A journals, and that is about 25% of all journals that they rate. Look at the number of B journals. There are 850 B journals, and I have gotten rejected by both B and by C journals. I've gotten rejected by my own journal, which is the South Asian JM Journal of Business Studies. So there is no assurance that you're going to get accepted just because you happen to submit a paper to a journal. You have to be able to play the game and to play the process of answering the reviewers and co-opting the reviewers through your process of sort of adjusting and adapting the manuscript. So there are about 982 C journals. That is about 36% of all journals that they evaluate. Most journals are look and ABDC revamps their ranking every three years. And most journals are looking to move from a C to a B to an A. ABDC also throws out journals that don't meet expectations from their last uh, ranking. So it's hard enough to get into the system. It is harder to stay in the system and move up the hierarchy because it is a fairly exclusive club. And journals are becoming very important in the research process of how academics are evaluated. So moving on, I'm going to talk very briefly about the JCR, which is the Journal Citation Report. And this is a publication by Clarivet Analytics. I was told that you had an earlier presentation by Clarivet and Analytics. I'm just going to say one quick thing about journal citation report that it is harder to get on the JCR ranking system. It is done by impact scores. And again, they like the FT50 ABDC also revamp the, the impact factors is a dynamic score. It changes every year. They also do five-year average impact scores. And one thing is you have to be an older journal to have a JCR ranking or you have to have an extremely prestigious pedigree to have a JCR ranking. So for example, if the Academy of Management brings out a new journal, it's just because of their pedigree, they are going to get a JCR ranking because they say, okay, these are the other three journals by the Academy of Management. They are going to have a certain quality, so we trust the quality and their credibility and they're going to get a JCR score. But typically, most other journals like athletes have to work their way to getting a JCR score. So moving on to the review process, I'm gonna talk a little bit about your role as an author and how you play your role as an author. So as I said before, SAJBS desk rejects 55% of all manuscripts received. We are not the top journal on the ladder. So if you go to a FT50 journal, they probably desk reject 90% of all manuscripts that they receive. So the key in the key in sort of starting to get published is to avoid desk rejection. So how is it that we avoid desk rejection? I think there are a couple of key things that I'm going to tell you that it makes sense to do. You shouldn't be in a hurry to submit your manuscript. Make sure you do a thorough and good job of looking at your manuscript cold and hard before you submit it. So first, it has to fit the format. So Emerald has a very good format, uh, and I'm gonna show you the format, and I'm gonna show how to be aligned to the format and how not to have an abstract. So first, your manuscript has to fill, uh, fit the format that the journal requires. Also, does it fit the scope of the journal? For example, if you're going to submit to my journal, I think the most easy rejection is 
when it doesn't fit the scope of the journal. So I read, for example, on average, in a month, I would say I at least reject five to eight manuscripts that are submitted that don't fit the geographic scope of the journal. So their research might be based in Ethiopia. It might be based in Vietnam. It might be based in China. Vietnam and China happen to be Asia, but they're not South Asia. They're Southeast Asia, or sometimes they're based in Iran, uh, the Arab Emirates. So although it is Asia, it's not South Asia. So you're looking for a different journal and that's not us. So does it fit the scope of the journal, both in terms of discipline? Also, it has to have a business implication and a business focus, and it has to have the regional focus. And the type of paper has to fit the type of papers that we publish. It has to be empirical, it has to be conceptual, or more recently, we have the executive insight series. Typically, papers have a certain word count. So a fully developed paper, for example, for the South Asian Journal of Business Studies should be 6,000 to 8,000 words, closer to 8,000, okay? And it is very important to frame your study. As I said, a lot of people have landed on a rich data set. So they run a bunch of graphs and they have very colorful graphs that look beautiful. I mean, you do bar charts and you do pie charts. Yeah, but we are not publishing papers based on the beauty of the graph. We are publishing papers, journals publish papers because <clears throat> the research has to be original. So one thing I say is, as, it, as an author, it's very important for you to identify what the research gap is that your paper is trying to fulfill. So you identify a research gap in light of the current published research. A lot of research that we publish are baby steps that sort of incrementally adds to the body of work in a particular field. So none of us by the work that we have published are going to change the world, but we are incrementally going to add knowledge to, some, to an area or a body of research. So you identify the research gap, then you say, what is the research question that you are looking to answer? And then based on the research question, excuse me, you develop specific hypotheses and propositions with arguments on from existing research to support your hypothesis and propositions. So it is very important to be able to identify how your research fits into the larger body of work that exists, rather than saying, okay, we, have, we are contributing to the field, we think what we're doing is new and exciting. That's not quite enough. So how do we do some of this that we are trying? How do we actually? So I said, one of the things is you have to make sure that the abstract fits the format of the journal. So this is an Emerald abstract format. And now this is the South Asian Journal uh, Business Studies. I've picked one of them anonymously to show you. The abstract should be a sort of concise summary of your paper. It has to do two things. It has to say how your research uh, is relevant to sort of the bigger body of research. And you have to sort of, in a very quick, concise way, communicate what your key findings are. In other words, what is so original about the paper that we should publish it and we should look at it and have it sort of sent through the review process. So your abstract is almost like a sales pitch for your paper. And oftentimes we, I read an abstract and say, wow, this looks interesting, I want to read it more closely. And sometimes I look at an abstract and say, what are they talking about? This is it, I'm gonna throw it back to the author to have them either, I'm gonna reject it or have them rework it. So this is how not to do an abstract, right? Some people just take their first paragraph of the paper and say abstract and put the first paragraph in. And that is really, the common mistakes you make about when you send in an abstract is A, you don't paraphrase your work. You have to give you, summarize your entire research project. So what was the basic question you were looking to ask? How did you, what was the mode of research? Did you use survey, secondary data? And what were your principal findings for the research and what are the implications for the research? So broadly, it has to summarize what you do. So you cannot just be lazy and take your first paragraph and say, okay, that serves as an abstract. Nobody's going to quite read it so closely. So let me just do it quickly and send it in. 
that's not going to work. So you have to sort of try and sell. It's kind of doing the elevator pitch for your paper when you do the abstract. And you have to include keywords that sort of present your paper when you do the abstract. Then I said that you have to talk about the main contribution of, so one of the primary, uh, just think of me as an editor. I look at close to 500 papers in a year. So one of the things you have to make it easier for the editor, for the reviewers, and for the associate editor to understand what you're doing. So once you've identified your research question, you have to come up with a proposed framework. I always think it's a great idea to have a quick, I do not want the results from your SPSS or your structural equation modeling program. What I want, what is good, is if you can come up with, with a nice, clearly articulated model for what your paper is trying to do. So what does this model do? The model clearly says, okay, this is the perform here. If I look at this model, it clearly articulates what the independent variable is, what the dependent variable is. And here, this has a mediated, moderated model. So they have a mediation uh, variable and they have two moderating variables. So when I look at this, I know, okay, this paper is trying to do both a mediation and a moderation approach to look at the relationship between performance appraisal and voice behavior. Now, what is the advantage of putting a model? The reviewers can quickly see. So if they look at the hypothesis, they look at the model, they can clearly understand what you're trying to do and how you're trying to contribute to the existing body of work. So I would strongly urge you as authors, uh, not only do you come up with a clear research question, but once you have all your variables, come up with a clear model. And also there is the one model, in the same model, you can also list your various hypotheses. So you can say hypothesis one looks at the first part. So you have a mediating relationship, which is hypothesis one. One A is the first part of the mediating relationship, one B is the second part of the mediating relationship. Then you have two moderating variables. So hypothesis two would be the moderating relationship of empowering leadership. And then three is the other moderating relationship. The other common mistake that authors make is they have hypothesis, but it has no direction whatsoever. So you can't just say performance appraisal is related to voice behavior. What is the direction of the relationship? Is it positively related? Is it negatively related? The other thing is also you cannot have the most intuitive relationships. You can't say everything is positively related or everything is sort of negatively related. Things are interesting sometimes when your findings are counterintuitive or based on theory or based on a specific regional phenomenon, you can find interesting insights and you can support them with your data. So I think a research model is very key and having hypotheses with directions are also very, very key. So once you have a good manuscript, once you've survived the desk rejection, the review process, as I told you earlier, is a three-level review process. So the editor-in-chief first looks at the paper. In our case, we have 10 associate editors, which are experts on the field. So based on whether it's a marketing, finance, accounting, strategy, I decide which associate editor to send the paper to. Then we have a bank of reviewers who sort of list themselves based on their areas of expertise. So the associate editor quickly reads the paper, skims through the paper and decides to assign the paper to three, at least three reviewers because ultimately we are looking to get two reviews based on which we can make the decision, which is why a lot of these good journals are called double blind review. So typically we look for the reviewers to stay with us through the entire review process. So first time they might most likely, I'd say 80% of the 80 to 90% of papers that go out for review, if they don't get rejected, would get, I'd say, say we say, send out, a, we receive about 500 manuscripts. Maybe we send out about 200 manuscripts or 220 manuscripts 
for review. Out of the 220, maybe 40 to 50 might get rejected after the first round of um, review. The remaining 170 to 180 get a major revision. The problem is many of the authors, first time authors particularly, are so disheartened when they get a major revision and they see all the things that they have to do. They say they want to withdraw their paper or never submit the paper back. So one of the things that I've tried to do is through all these workshops and conferences where I've spoken is that you have to persist. You have to believe in your paper. So when they ask you for a major revision, you have to do a good faith effort to do a major revision. So if you don't, so many, so I'd say 20% 20, 20 of authors don't revise their manuscripts and send it back. But if you do revise your manuscripts and send it back, then it goes back to the reviewers. And typically you've done a lot of the things that they've asked. And so perhaps they'll ask you to do a minor revision because there's still a few things that they want you to adjust. So the typical profile of a manuscript goes through a major revision, a minor revision, and then perhaps a conditional accept before it gets accepted. So essentially what you're doing through the review process is you are co-opting the reviewers by trying to listen to them and doing what they suggest. And let me assure you, in every instance, when you do this, the manuscript gets better, it becomes much more current, and it is far more readable because you are working with other experts in the field that are getting your manuscript pretty much up to speed. So, What, when you, what is it that you have to do to manage the review process? How do you co-opt the reviewer? So as I said, reviewers can either like your manuscript, marginally like your manuscript, like it very much. So you have to carefully read the reviews and see which is the reviewer that you can most easily co-opt and bring over to your, your side. And then when you address the reviewers, you have to try and do most of what the, that reviewer is asking. But even if a reviewer does not like a lot of what you do, the question is, how do you bring that reviewer to your side by doing what they're asking you to do and also telling them what you've done so that they believe that you've addressed what they have asked you to do? So one of the things I always tell authors is when they respond to reviewers, they have to be very thorough they have to be very clear in terms of what they're doing they have to communicate clearly what they have done so i i mean it's not my unique way of doing it but this is how they always recommend you do it so when you're responding to reviewers rather than just say done and send the paper back you have to repeat what the reviewer is asking you to do you have to provide a response as to how you've done it. And then you take and cut and paste an extract of the paper of where that has been done and reference the page numbers and the paragraph where it has been done. The interesting part of this is sometimes your response to the reviewer is almost as long as the paper. In good journals, I'd say sometimes it is longer because you sort of repeat what you're doing and you know, you, you say what you've done and you provide the abstract from the paper. So I'm going to actually use, uh, I'm going to show you a response to the reviewers. So here is a template for responding to for peer review comments. So I'm going to say that this is how you would respond. If you can see, most of the time you're being, you, you do not want to be combative and fight. This is not a shouting match with the editor or the reviewer. You are trying to be friendly. You are trying to be diligent. You're trying to be disciplined and you're trying to buy the reviewer over to your, bring the reviewer over to your side by the quality of the work you do, not by how much you shout or how much you fight. So for example, you paste, as I said, the full reviewer comment here, 
And then you type your response for what you are doing. Explain what you're doing. You say, thank you for pointing this out. We think you've made a great suggestion. And this is what we have done to actually meet what you are saying. So in most cases, I would recommend that you agree and do what the reviewer asks you to do. But there are cases sometimes when the reviewer might ask you to go in a completely different direction than what you want your paper to take the reader. So it is OK to OK. You should, one of the things I'm going to say is you cannot disagree with every suggestion that the reviewer makes just because you don't want to change anything that you do. But Let's say the reviewer makes eight suggestions. You can agree with six and say disagree with two, and but you have to give a very good reason as to why you're disagreeing with the suggestion. You can say, thank you for the suggestion. It would have been interesting to explore this aspect, but with respect to our study, it seems out of scope. A, because the theoretical underpinning of it is different. B, we do not have data in this uh, survey that we have collected for the for the variables that you're looking to ask us to explore. So it is okay to disagree, but as far as possible, you have to try and agree. So if they ask you to reference other papers, if they ask you to reference other theory, you need to be able to do it. If they ask you to present the results differently, if they ask you to add to the limitations, there are some things that are easier to do. So I would suggest that in most cases, you agree with the reviewers and do what the reviewers are asking you to do. So the important thing is that you need to co-opt the reviewers. I have had instances where the, a reviewer hated the paper in the first round, gradually came around and eventually sort of grudgingly said, okay, I think this paper is ready to be published. So it's not easy. It is a tedious, iterative process but it certainly can happen, but a lot depends on how diligently you do it. So I'm gonna give you some quick do's and don'ts of the review uh, of, uh, of an author, as an author in the review process. One of the things I would say is, and, and the don'ts are almost the flips of the do's. One of the do's is you have to be on time in submitting revisions. Uh, and if you cannot be on time, you need to be upfront, honest, and ask the editor for an extension. And once you're given the extension, you have to meet that timeline. So you can ask for a 45-day extension, a two-month extension. You've even asked for a six-month extension. But <clears throat> be upfront and be sure that you can keep the commitment to the timeline once they've given you the extension. Like I told you, in the uh, slide before, you have to submit a detailed response to the reviewer as, and you have to submit the paper and the response to reviewers separately. Now, one of the, I'm gonna give you a quick tip. In the revision, most journals say, provide your response here so you can cut and paste it but I also upload the response separately as a supplemental file when I upload the revision. So when you upload the revision, make sure you delete the earlier version of the paper, make sure you delete the earlier uh, response, and make sure that you, again, upload the main paper, the response, the, uh, the main paper, the, app, the new abstract, your affiliation, sometimes, Authors' affiliations can ch change. So I often have authors contact me after the paper has been accepted because they have been too busy to change it during the process. So if your affiliation has changed, if you've added a new author, make sure you do it as the paper is being revised. And finally, do a cover letter where you summarize broadly what you've done and thank the editor and the reviewers for doing it. So a couple of things of what not to do. I very frequently get cryptic responses saying, done. They post a comment and say, done. I have no idea what they've done. I have no idea how they've done it. And you should think that it's more important for the author because you are more interested in getting the paper published 
most reviewers are looking or editors are looking to reject it because they want to make the gatekeeping tougher. Also, do not do sloppy responses. Make sure that you're, you read the review comment very clearly and directly address it. And the other thing is, <clears throat> there are some people that, there are some authors that don't meet the deadline and don't communicate. So we have no idea what's happening. Six months later, they suddenly wake up and realize that they have a revision that's due. And they just sort of said, tell me, oh, they're ready to revise it, but you never told me. So I have to really extend it within Scholar One to allow you to be able to uh, revise the manuscript because journals often after a certain period of time archive the manuscript and then it's very hard to take it out. So then it becomes a fresh submission. So you have to do the work all over again. So my suggestion is you be in constant communication, not so much that you irritate the editor. One of the other things I would suggest is don't do overdo it, but you can also, if you're not sure that the a particular manuscript fits the scope of the journal, you can send it in advance to the editor and find out to what extent it fits the scope of the journal. So I'm going to say you have to be diligent, disciplined, and patient, and sort of work through the process. Just as you are impatient for your paper to get published, editors are working with many authors and reviewers, most of whom are doing work on a voluntary basis. So you have to be patient so that the process can take its course. So I'm going to sort of close with some general publishing tips. So the first thing is all submitted work has to be original. In other words, you can't sort of tweak a previously published paper or a paper that has been previously published in proceedings which have an ISS N number. If a paper has been published in a proceedings, you have to be able to change either by adding variables or tweaking what you're doing so that it's different. Also, all contributions, whether if there are uh, uh, people that have offered uh, sort of grants for data, or if there are authors, uh, if there are uh, researchers that have contributed to in an advisory capacity, you need to acknowledge them maybe in a footnote up front. Also, when you cite from other papers, you cannot cut and paste paragraphs from other papers. That is plagiarism. You have to paraphrase their work by how it becomes relevant to your work. And the other thing is some papers have reference lists almost as long as the paper. Try and be rational about the one, the papers that you use as references and Try and use the ref try and sort of bring the references. If you've used the reference in the introduction, try and bring it back again in the discussion section to see how it all sort of fits in and ties the paper together. If you're using unpublished work that you have worked on before, you need to cite it. So if it's a working paper, you need to cite it. So you need to cite the source of a lot of the statements that you're making in the paper. Some additional publishing tips, and this is primarily to paraphrase what I told you earlier, is, as I told you, in order to get through the gatekeeping, you have to make sure the manuscript fits the scope of the journal. Also, authors are very tempted to cite their own papers. I think they keep citing as if they're the only ones that have done research in the field. It is okay to cite if you've done a seminal piece in that uh, area, of course, cite yourself, but do not just, you cannot just cite your paper. So avoid to even experienced authors tend to do that. The other thing is you need to have recent citations. So let's say you're recycling a paper. You This paper has been rejected by many, many journals. You're sort of recycling it. Even so, you need to look at the recent work that your uh, that your the journal that you're submitting to has published in the area and you need to update your citation list so that you have a fair at least 30 percent of your citations have to be within the last five years the next guideline is you have to make sure that the word count so if i, I told you sajbs most journals typically look for six thousand to eight thousand words 
I have received papers that have 22,000, 15,000. It's almost like they've taken a part of their dissertation or they've done this huge report and submitted it to me. Most of the time, if it seriously exceeds it, I reject it because I think this is, uh, you know, you haven't even read what the journal guidelines are. But you have to make sure that the if you sort of marginally exceed, so I say I'm looking for 8,000 and you have 9,500, then I would unsubmit it and send it back to you. So you have to make sure that the abstract, the word count, and the author non-disclosure sort of fits what the journal is looking for. And the final thing is always do a cover letter, at least in the first time submission, do a cover letter to the editor saying, why is it that this paper that you've done, why do you think it's a good piece of work that deserves a sort of review and possible space in your journal? Why does it fit the journal? And why do you think it's worth looking at it through the review process? So I hope you got some kind of insights as to what it takes to get published. I hope you're going away with a little more knowledge of the whole publishing process and how you evaluate journals. And these are all, this is all that I have to say. And I'm happy to take any questions from uh, the audience or the panel. Thank you all for being a patient audience. It was a pleasure to present to you. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Let me just get off so that I can have my camera back. I couldn't see you. I, I, request, see. Uh, I request the audience to please post their uh, questions if they have any, and uh, we'll, we'll start the question and answer round shortly. Is there some way that I can get the camera back on, uh, Disha? The or, camera is on, and we no, can see you. Can you take the pre presenter? Uh, yes, I will do that. I will do that. Maybe then I can see the panelists, and that makes it a little more. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shanti, if I may ask a question before the Q&A round starts. Uh, it's related to your, your presentation where you mentioned uh, special issues. And I think mm -hmm. that's one process that a lot of people struggle with, especially in associating with uh, a well-known journal or well-established journal. So, mm -hmm. you know, what are the challenges you face as an editor when you get... I can't hear you. Uh, yeah, we're we'll losing yeah, that, yeah okay. is it better okay yeah so i think better, uh, one of the uh, things we want to understand is also as an editor how do you choose what special issue you want to collaborate on and um, what would be the elements that you'll be looking for in a proposal so one of the things that i've tried to do uh, so initially i wasn't as selective because i just wanted to get it going and because we hadn't done too many special issues um I started with a special issue that is very close to my area of research because I wanted to see what was done. So the first special issue that I commissioned at SAJBS was um, on creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. But more recently, I have become more selective in special issues uh, and how we choose special issues. So one is I've looked at areas that I think the journal should uh, sort of showcase. And also you have to have good special issue editors because I think it's both the people. So the people that sort of propose the special issue have to be relatively well published in that area. So it helps to then sort of sell the special issue, market the special issue and get response. So one of our most successful special issues was on work family balance, which we did last year. 
And the two people that were working on it were both extremely well published and very well known within that area. So we try to get a diversity of topics when we pick special issues. I wanted to do this one on social media in marketing because we hadn't done any marketing special issues. And we're also doing an IT tech special issue. So part of it is you pick the topic so that you cover a diverse variety of areas. And I also look at the people that are submitting the proposal because I want to make sure that they are published because as a special issue guest editor, they have complete independence in how the issue is run. I really don't gatekeep at all. They are the gatekeepers of what gets accepted. So basically, I make sure that they have high standards, they have published. So I think it's both the topic and the people. And more recently, I've had to reject special issues because every conference in India now, they write to me because we have a special issue for Indam, they want to do a special issue for their conference. And I tell them, look, it, it is, I'd love to associate with you, but I, I cannot sort of have a special issue for every conference that's, I mean, they say we are, we are a prestigious conference and many of these institutions are prestigious, but we, we cannot afford to have so many special issues. So I've become much more selective. So I, I'd say broadly by discipline and by the people, the guest editors that propose the special issue and their research background. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I think a lot of our audience members also strive to get, you know, get uh, a special issue. And I think they should give them some idea on why rejections also happen. Mm -hmm. so, thank you so much. Uh, Disha, sure. are, we, uh, are we good to go with the Q&A? Absolutely. <clears throat> so the first question that we have is uh, that 6 to 8% acceptance rate is way lower than many A, B, D, C, A and A star journals. What is your opinion in this regard? Uh, it's not lower than A to A star journal. I think we have a lot more novice authors that submit to us. So I said that our acceptance, uh, we used to have a 15% acceptance rate. So partly the reason is that we get a lot more people that just submit. So I'm, I'm including the desk rejection. So I'm a bulk of the rejection happens at the first stage because it just doesn't fit, you know, the paper is not ready to go out for review. So previously we were much, much more developmental. So we would work with the authors over many, many uh, cycles to get the paper accepted. Now we have become more selective, I desk project. So I guess the six to eight is A, because we receive more submissions, two, because of special issues and because the journal has become better known, uh, we are uh, raising the bar. And I think this is one of the reasons why we are going to get evaluated as a better journal in the next round of ABDC. And I think it is the process of evolution of any good journal. So if you look at like the A star journal, several of them are like two to three percent. They might say six to eight percent, but it's like two to three percent because they just reject almost 95 percent of papers they receive. Uh, just following that question, um, someone has asked, can papers be rejected solely on the word limits? Typically, I don't we don't reject papers on word limit. But as I told you, if our word limit is six to eight thousand and you send me a twenty two thousand, twenty five thousand, yes, I'll reject it because it's, it's way you haven't even read. The author hasn't read the guidelines, but let's say it's ten thousand. Then we'll work with the author to bring it down to and we'll give them suggestions as to how to bring it under the word count. So we would not normally reject just on the basis of word count. Unless it's seriously over the word count, like I said. Yeah. So, uh, so in addition to what uh, Professor Santi stated, so uh, uh, as journals, word count matters sometimes. It, it costs for the publisher, I mean, for the institution. Uh, if you consider about uh, South Asian Journal of Marketing, we consider about 7,000 uh, word count. So uh, more than 7,500, 8,000, we do not consider because it costs cost us a lot a page so uh, th uh, there is a limitation so we have to pay so uh, so that uh, sometimes for some journals 
uh, word count that is a kind of a considerable thing so you have to adhere the author guidelines when submitting the paper to those kind of journals well given a respect to both professor shanti and uh, professor jayanta's opinion i'm i'm a sort of like it depends what kind of paper is coming to me if it is a review paper i myself know that yes it's it's going to have more word count and i cannot treat all the papers with the same word count so there i see that what is the rigor and depth that author have applied and if to bring that content into the paper deserve to have i'm not saying that it only require but also deserve to have a better or or bigger word count then yes in discussion with editors some word limit can be permitted and sometimes i did it like i do it for 1000 word 1500 words specifically when i see that yes this is also something important to be given and i do it okay. mainly for the review review papers only because they are little lengthy compared to the empirical papers uh, what do you do dr shanti in that case i mean if you have a review paper in the, you see that yes word count may require now i am um, i feel that uh, you can say whatever i think ultimately it's two things right you have to also have the reader engaged and uh, i think brevity if you can say things within the word count i increasingly feel that even most good journals no matter how you're writing they say 30 pages is the page limit and i i've increasingly found that you can say what you want to say so i enforce the word limit including for review papers and i think um part of it is also i think the more the more selective you can be the more you can enforce it so uh if that's what it takes to get published and i think people are going to do it and uh, i feel that it's it's a discipline that you're basically enforcing on the author and i think it's doable uh, i thought of agree with you perhaps for review papers you can give them a little more leeway because they are sort of exploring the entire um, you know sort of area within a field but even so a lot of the good journals do it within sort of i mean emerald allows 8200 words which is a fairly significant number it's like 30 32 pages that's quite a significant uh space to do, to say what you have to say so i mean i i think maybe for review papers but increasingly i've begun to enforce the word limit yeah, yeah sometimes it's also happened that what are the number of papers that they are synthesizing if the number of papers and say sub categories of sub domains are high then putting one liner two liner three liner for for those is really difficult it doesn't really sound good good to eyes to the readers too so in that cases like i i feel that no some space to be given um, i mean i did it for review papers only considering that what is required to be given no that Actually, i that's what, if yes, any uh, that's where you should give the the way if anywhere you want to make an exception that's perhaps where you would make the exception i think this is very interesting that we have perspective from different uh, you know publishing models that all all your journals for you know are using and uh, and it, i think it's a very good take away for all the audience members to know that uh, decisions regarding what papers will be accepted ultimately lies with an editor and also their discussion on whether they are okay to accept a word limit that exceeds what has been defined in the journal guideline so but it is always safer to stick to the numbers that have been mentioned in the journal guideline it is to be safe because we can't uh, always predict what the journal editor's uh, decision would be that we have to wait yeah uh, like for me the submission increased more than 700 for this year for in fee business review and many others reach out to me saying that hey professor you are want you want me to cut down to the word limit what should i delete i mean how can i decide that from where you should cut down to the words and what you should delete I mean, but more authors i'm dealing with they they really engage so much into the conversation and email happening on the word limit 
is really difficult so here my suggestion too from uh, my for my authors here is that yes it is important and we cannot decide that what you should delete and where you should cut down to the words we cannot do that you the your paper is your brainchild so you should know what what you think is important to put together yes in addition to what professor sudhir said so as editors we can accommodate around more than 20 percent or 25 percent if there is a very good contribution of the manuscript so if not as editors we do not consider even for a conceptual paper we do not consider more than 20 percent of word count so uh, because the as i earlier say stated so uh, for every journal there is a cost behind these all the factors so uh, editors uh, they need to care about that so that is the main reason so you have to adhere the submission guidelines so if there is a very good contribution so we will consider about 20 to 25 uh, percent enhancement so thanks and i think it's also you're sort of putting more of a discipline on the author you know they they have to read it they have to make sure that they're saying what they're saying in the best possible way that they're saying it because i think most of us try to i mean i think the starting time is you your first time you write something is just kind of a stream of consciousness but writing is very iterative so i think you have to read and sort of make sure that you're saying what you want to say in the best and most concise way that you say that you can get to say it because Absolutely. you have to keep your reader in mind always you've got to have your reader with you throughout so often you think you've written a masterpiece but you know others reading it may not agree with you and i think the important thing is you're writing to the audience not for yourself true true and for the beginning they're writing for gatekeepers exactly true you have to get through the gatekeeping to get into the review process yes absolutely thank you so much now uh, we have a lot of people asking us how they can become reviewers and part of the the editorial board of the journal okay so everybody wants to first become get onto the editorial board but that's a fairly selective group so typically what i ask people to do is if you're interested in reviewing send me an email and send me an email with your cv and you know one of the things is i want to see that you have published and one of the things we also do for reviewers is typically we sort of pair up new review novice reviewers with experienced reviewers and i get all my associate editors to rank reviewers so we have a score so they turn the reviews back in time now a lot of these a lot of people that review for me just say the journal asks a bunch of questions so does this have a good empirical contribution yes does it, uh, it have they ex have they written well yes so reviewing is not about giving monosyllable answers and then they say accept yes 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 accept or no 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 reject review is about you providing some sort of it you it takes some time so when you agree to review you have to make sure that you read the paper carefully read related research or no related research and give good suggestions to authors so we actually rank reviewers so first you if you uh, sign up to be a reviewer and we think that you've done some work in the area then we'll assign papers to you along with experienced reviewers then we watch reviews so i've invited people to the editorial board a when they've published in an area and they do excellent reviews over time. Then they consistently do. So they do three, four reviews for me and each of them is excellent. It's not that I'm looking for them to you know, give and accept or I'm not looking for a particular outcome, but the quality of what they write. And sometimes they stay with the, you know, some, it's sometimes a paper goes to two or three revisions. Good reviewers stay with the paper through the iterations that a paper goes through. So getting on the editorial, being a reviewer is not tough. If you want to be a reviewer, sign up, tell me your areas of interest, and we'd be happy to send paper. We'll definitely, in the next year, definitely send you one or two papers. 
But whether you use that experience to get on the editorial board is how you use that experience as a reviewer and what you've otherwise done in your publishing. So that's what I don't generally just take people. I look at your age indexes. I look at how much you've published. I look at what your recent publication record is before I invite people onto the editorial review board because I want them to be sort of credible. I want them to be experienced. And I want them to be an excellent resource for the journal. So I don't sort of willy-nilly put people on the, invite people to the ERB, but certainly a reviewer, I, I, you're absolutely welcome. And I really welcome people that sign up and want to be reviewers. I don't know if that answers my, and like there are some seasoned professors that have asked to be on the ERB. I say, please first sort of help us with some reviews. And if you're doing that, I, I can also see whether they turn things around, whether they're responsive. Because if I have an editorial, uh, if I have an editorial board member that doesn't sort of constantly declines, then they're really not being of much help to me. So I want to see that you're responsive and you can do what you're, uh, you can contribute before I sort of invite you. Because we only have about 30 to 35 uh, ERBs. Although we have, I think, somewhere between 400 and 600 reviewers. So it's a fairly small, exclusive group. And we sort of turn it around. It's not that once you become an ERB, you stay an ERB. If you come onto the ERB and you don't contribute, we sort of, we look at that list and keep revising that list. In fact, we had an interesting story. We had one uh, a reviewer from Sri Lanka who initially was a very, who contributed a lot. And then last year she kept declining. Then we found out she'd become the ambassador to Norway. So obviously she had other commitments and could not keep up her editorial board commitments. So it's it's people who sort of move on at, you know, at one point in their life, it's important, but they move on to do other things. So we also sort of look at our ERB and uh, see, whether we want them, whether they want to continue and whether we want them to continue. It's by mutual consent. True. That's really good, uh, Dr. Shanti. Uh, there can be another way also, like uh, what people can do is they can update their ORCID and then create a, an account with a journal and have the keywords of their expertise filled in. And so because we deal with the automated process, so whenever we use those keywords, possibly we'll look at your ORCID and see what your publishing or reviewing history is. So that is also another way. So more journals you want to get attached as a reviewer is update your ORCID, open your account with that journal and update your profile. Now, this and Publons helps. now is doing also, yeah, you Publons can also, also update yeah. your review profile with Publons, yeah. Okay, so the next question is actually um, aimed to understand uh, the timelines of the of the journal. So someone has asked that how does SAJM secure novelty of of research specifically focused on COVID nineteen and its impact if it's consuming six to eight months for the review process? Are you, I, I guess you're asking Dr. Jayantha this question, or are you asking me? Anybody, it's for anybody to answer. So, I mean, we've already published papers on COVID. In fact, we had uh, one of our associate editors was in Kerala and he wrote a very interesting insight piece on how Kerala is addressing COVID using the triple helix model. So we have published uh, papers on COVID. Um, the response time is the response. I mean, we uh, there are some papers in review. So it depends on... Uh, I, the question you're asking is are we going to process papers because uh, it relates to COVID faster um, unless it's an executive insight not particularly but we have a special issue we have two special issues on COVID so I guess they're going to process COVID focused papers it's on entrepreneurship and innovation in in the era of COVID so and typically special issues get processed faster because they have a they close at a particular time and then you sort of review all the papers together. So 
I'm going to give you a two, basically say two things. One is we have already published, and if it particularly is an insight piece, it's likely to get published faster because the review process is sort of simpler. But if you're doing an empirical or data-driven piece on COVID, it's going to take probably the normal time it takes to publish, which is six to eight months. But given how long COVID has been around, I think we might still end up publishing it in time. I mean, it's already 18 months into COVID and we're probably going to have, it's going to be around for another eight to 12 months. So it's not super, it's not going to be super fast, but we have special issues that are COVID focused. And so therefore it might hasten the review process a little bit. Right. So we, I, I think we seem to have a ghostwriter <laughs> amongst us because uh, his question is that uh, due to some personal reasons, he cannot disclose, he cannot disclose his his identity or his association. I apologize. He cannot disclose his association or you know where the the organization that he is associated to. He wants to know can he still uh, publish his paper if he wants to? Nope. Nope. <laughs> the author and the affiliation clearly they have to be upfront, and if they change their affiliations, they have to update it. It's a fairly transparent process. It's not we cannot Absolutely. have authors. And okay. and it's a it's it's a credibility. It's a kudos. Why would somebody like to hide the identity? For what right. reason? I mean, organizations support publishing. Yeah, I think it's for uh, the the author author to uh, you know solve their personal matter and see if if they would really like to get that. Uh, research published with us or any other publisher for that matter. So he's written even if he's submitting an email ID, they just want to know uh, they are going they are going to be corresponding, but they just don't want their association to be uh, made public. I mean, as uh, Dr. Sudhir said, it's it's something that brings prestige. It's something that's yeah. not the accomplishment. So why would you want to hide it? It's something that would make but you proud. Yeah, uh, I'm sure uh, the, the person does have a backstory, but uh, you know, I thought it would be nice to take it up for, uh, you yeah, know, over yeah, the yeah. platform. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So there are a lot of people who are asking if uh, the the journal has an APC. Sorry? There are a lot of people asking if the journal has an article processing charge or a charge. fee, and if there is, then how much is it? No, we don't have an article processing charge. We just like them to volunteer as reviewers because our it's just our time and our time is voluntary. And so every reviewer that reviews for the journal does it voluntarily. So when authors get impatient, they have to realize that just as they are waiting for their reviews, it'll help that I'm hundreds of other people waiting for their reviews. So we need good reviewers. So there is no fee, but we'd like some of their time if they're willing to give it to us. Um, Ma'am, I think uh, the question would be more relevant from an author's perspective, because uh, your journal currently has two options, which is your gold open access and green open access, which the authors can choose. So yes, the gold open access does have an article processing charge of uh, 2,495 uh, pounds per article, but that's absolutely a choice of the author if they yeah. wish to take. Yes. Yeah. And personally, I think the non-open access where they don't pay and they're blind reviewed has more prestige for them when they get accepted, right? Otherwise, they're getting paid to get heard. Otherwise, they're getting heard on the merit of what they're saying. Absolutely, ma'am. I think uh, I'm sorry. I'm not able to switch on my camera just uh, now. Um, but uh, going by what you're saying, one of the reasons also why we are promoting platinum open access is it removes the price barrier from the author's shoulders. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, we understand that when payment is involved, we or editors are likely to get articles that are based on the author's ability to pay that fee rather than the merit of the article. 
so and we also i think a big challenge for a lot of editors is that good articles don't get submitted for the because of the price factor often put on uh, put by some journals like for example a completely gold open access journal so i think uh, even in terms of open access there is a lot of changes a lot of evolution happening even now especially now because of the pandemic and the way people are accessing research and how it's become very important to highlight the research coming from any institute or any uh, geographical region but mm -hmm. uh, yes uh, i think uh, this is an endeavor of a lot of publishers a lot of institutes a lot of editors to how to make research free and uh, remove the onus of uh, you know the burden of uh, fees from the authors that's what we, uh, that's the direction we all are working towards uh, it comes with its own challenges but hopefully in the coming time we'll start seeing a lot more barriers being dropped uh, and we are able to support a lot of good articles uh, just based on the merit of uh, what they're presenting yes i also agree with uh, ms sangeeta so in addition to what sangeeta said uh, if you consider about the publication there is a cost uh, cost is to be bared by either by authors either by readers or either by the institution so uh, there are three parts so if it is by the authors that is the apc uh, if it is by the readers that is uh, for subscription basically in order to access the content of a database if it is by institution it will be kind of a open platinum access where uh, authors and readers uh, for them it will be free yeah, well said yeah mm -hmm. Somebody has to pay for it. The question is how who pays for it. Exactly. Yes, of course, ma'am. <laughs> okay. So the next question is uh, someone who's asked uh, about the analysis and how they're using it in the paper. So uh, someone has written research where they have used the the, the S S P S for analysis. Uh, software for analysis they wanted to know whether it will be acceptable for your journal or is it necessary to use the smart pls analysis as a as a part of, of making sure it gets accepted no we don't uh, we don't determine what methodology to use they can use any methodology that they think fits the question they're trying to ask it's not that we only publish pls or you know sem or it, it uh, there is no particular model that we think is better than the other the only thing is, as I suggest, as I had uh, said in my presentation, it's important to present what you're doing very clearly. So you have a model. The methodology you use should make sense in the context of the model that you're proposing, and you have to have hypothesis which you test. So I think it, it doesn't matter what method you use, but you have to use the method that makes sense in the context of the question you're asking and the hypothesis that you set up. Right. So uh, the next question is that if a manuscript has been rejected in one journal, will it affect uh, if we if the person would like to get it published in another journal? Not at all. But what I'm saying is that clearly you should make the effort to align or to sort of marginally tweak it before you submit it. So. If you send me a paper, I when I read, when I look at a paper, I know it's a reject from another journal because they've not bothered to change the abstract format. They've not bothered, they've they have all the highlighted, in fact, I just saw a paper last week, all the highlighted revisions they've done for the previous journal sent to me. So they have not even bothered to accept their changes and make it look like a new submission. So I think a couple of basic things you need to do, make sure that the abstract fits. Make sure that you at least add one or two citations of recent research that this journal has published that relate to your research. And make sure that it looks like you're, make sure that you want to get published in this journal, not like you're throwing a manuscript at this journal and saying, okay, I have this great work, look, I mean, publish it. Because I think part of it is recognizing and respecting the journal you're submitting it to. In addition to that, most importantly, you have to address the reviewer comments of the previous journal as well. That is really important. I think uh, Professor Santi will, I mean, agree on that point. 
to the extent think, you can do it. I mean, I think sometimes they ask you to do things which you cannot do and then, yes, but I think, yes, if you have some basic flaws, I absolutely agree. You should address it to the extent you can because you don't get asked the same questions again. I think one more important aspect is why we have uh, journal guidelines which are so different for every journal, even within the same publishing house. It is also to eliminate cases where uh, an author does multiple submissions at the same time. And I think editors are easily able to identify those cases as well, because if it doesn't follow the journal guideline, it's a, usually a proof that possibly it has been submitted elsewhere. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. So, and we've been doing this a long time. So, you know, they, the authors have to recognize that. But it's absolutely okay to, as I said, you, you sometimes it's hard to find the journal that is the right fit. So it's absolutely okay to submit rejected manuscripts to another journal. There's nothing to stop you doing it, but you just need to make sure that you're doing it the right way. I think uh, maybe I can, uh, I think Disha, uh, it's not audible for some reason. Um, I think this is a very interesting question that we have received. It says, why is the journal focus limited to South Asia? Would it not restrict the readership and author submission? And are there plans to expand the journal beyond South Asia? I think this was how Emerald decided to position the journal. So I, I came here and I was given the task of uh, Finding so I guess they found a sort of gap about uh, in, in journals that relate to South Asia, and I guess there are journals that focus in different geographies. So I guess th this journal happens to be focused on South Asia. So, I think uh, just to add to what you're saying, Professor Shanti, I think uh, yes, we as publishers uh, and editors we have to identify where are the gaps in research what we want to cover. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think a very simple example would be in terms of magazines that we read. So you don't want to read the celebrity gossip in, uh, say, business world. And uh, you know exactly what content to expect. So it, keeping in mind the readership, uh, it becomes important to, uh, you know, sometimes like when we discuss journals uh, that we are signing up, we also look at the scope and uh, of the topics that it covers, because if it is too wide, it has no focus. Uh, then the reader doesn't know what to, what to expect with every issue. And uh, similarly, if it is too narrow, it can limit the kind of submissions that could be coming in. So I think uh, both these aspects are very important when we decide uh, what is the, what is, how is the journal going to be shaped. And also, I think in terms of topic, uh, there's so many journals on, say, marketing. How do they differentiate from each other? What What determines what kind of articles will go into one and will not go into another, though they all may say marketing in their title. So I think that also is an important side to understanding how journals are uh, set up and how they're shaped. And I think it's also unique because I think South Asia brings many unique things to the table. So I think the way you can sort of uh, showcase your paper is sort of because a lot of theories which are uh, sort of developed for the Western audience, you can apply it in a completely different way in the South Asian context. And that's basically what the journal contributes to research. And I think also in terms of readership, it doesn't mean limitation because we see that uh, there are a lot of, uh, maybe a, a paper that's on agriculture in India could be read in uh, uh, one of the Western countries also. They may be referring to it, but it says uh, specifically re with the uh, challenges of South Asia in mind. As an emerging market, we also set a standard of what could be normal. Uh, if we start looking at West for everything, it is setting a different normal. So mm -hmm. it becomes, uh, sorry. No, no, in fact, there are several concepts that are uniquely South Asian. For example, this uh, th there's a stream of research being published about Jugad how India innovates and it's sort of very, and I think that's become 
it's gotten hold in the Western literature now, because how is innovation in the developing world different? And how can they mm. use those kind of innovation models? So it doesn't just flow from the West to the developing world, but also research concepts flow the other way because they're finding out new things that work in the developing concept, in context, which might be more applicable because the developed world is becoming much more. They're taking their cues from the developing world now. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I may Thank add because we, are, we also have a South Asian journal, focus journal. Uh, well, what we see is that the business model have been different considering different continents. It was one, so the practices, culture, there have been many things different into the management and business practices, one. And second is that how do we move from generalization to specialization? So geography is also one of the specialization. And when we see the funnel moving from generalization to specialization, it is not only the concept that make difference. This is also geographical focus that makes the difference. So we would like to portray ourselves as specialized in the business practices in South Asia, though concept we consider from all across the globe. I completely agree with Professor Sudhir. So we are keen on very specific issues in the South Asia, rather focusing on broader issues, but I mean broader world. So it will provide a platform where South Asian researchers can uh, submit their papers to the uh, uh, journals published specifically focusing on the South Asian con context. So the, I mean, infrastructure development with regard to the uh, region, that is a requirement, that is a major requirement. So journal that could be considered as a one, one of the aspects of infrastructure development in the region. I mean, you know, we did a, we did a symposium at the Academy of Management saying, how can you actually write something for South Asia? One is your data can be South Asian focused. Two, you can do a comparison between the West and South Asian countries and say how we are different based on the sure. context, like Dr. Anna was saying. Three, you can actually adapt and come up with new theories for South Asia just because the context is different, like things like Jugad, because resources True. are constrained, because you have to do things faster. So there are many ways you can be sort of South Asia focused and be different than sort of a broad right. general journal. And the contribution is by its specificity because it, it is sort of bringing different kinds of things to the table when you do fairly specific research. Absolutely, Professor. Yeah. I second your thought. And it was sort of discussion with our journal, International Journal of Emerging Markets too. That how do we differentiate like emerging markets, developing markets, there are different uh, nomenclatures too. Right. And in IB theories, we see that resource seeking firms and resource rich firms and economies per se. So one should not fit all. And this is what we have also observed the policy modernization and governance of these uh, in South Asian countries are very different than mm -hmm. other continents and parts of the globe. So possibly the same thing which is being implemented cannot be replicated because and also, sorry, uh, pardon me to highlight this issue. Um, because research transverted a little late into the South Asia regions and what was happening was that the model that was tested into the Western world or so-called developed economies were kind of replicated in testing into the South Asia region too. And what we want to do is we want to escape those. We do not want just something that has been tried and tested there. You test the same thing here too. We do not want that. We, we want you to come up with some theories that may have a, a sync with the previous theories or it can be altogether a different theory that may not exist. So what we want is we do not want you to replicate the same model or say test the same model that I have chosen a different geography. This theory have been tested in US, Australia or any other part of the world and now I'm testing it for South Asia. So therefore it has become a paper of South Asia. No, I, I like I don't know my colleagues may may agree may not but I do not consider that as a South Asian study what what I typically want to see is that yes you have considered some specific aspects from South Asia and bring something from South Asia for South Asia so thank you very much uh, uh, Professor Santi Dr. Sudhirana Ms. Sangeeta Menon 
so now the time is 6:30 so now i would like to invite ms chaturi aryaratna in order to deliver the vote of thanks thank you so much sir permission from all now we are marking the end of another remarkable milestone of a very insightful webinar series and it's my privilege to have been asked to propose the vote of thanks i on behalf of the emerald publishing Gulf Medical University and Faculty of Management Studies, University Sabarugumu University of Sri Lanka, and my own behalf, extend very hearty word of thanks to the main speaker of this session, Professor Shanti Gopalakrishnan, Editor in Chief of the South Asian Journal of Business Studies. Ma'am, it was indeed an insightful session with full of learnings on the process of publishing research and many more. At the outset, I would like to express my profound gratitude to the Faculty of Management Studies of the Sabargumu University of Sri Lanka, headed by Professor Atula Nyanapala. Further, I would like to express my special gratitude to Professor Aslam, Chairman, and all the other members of the Research and Publication Unit of the Faculty of Management Studies for their unconditional support on the program. I would also like to express our sense of obligations to regional coordinators for their kind guidance and also helping us strengthening the numerous mechanisms. In particular, the support rendered by Dr. Jayanta in Devasiri, senior lecturer, Sabaragumo University of Sri Lanka, Ms. Sangeeta Menal, publishing relationship manager, Emerald Publishing, Professor Sudhir Rana, Gulf Medical University, and Professor Hashif Sahid, Gift University, Pakistan. In fact, you all support enormously in making this program a reality and with a grand success. Then, with the gratitude, let me thank Ms. Disha Lakanpal, Regional Marketing Manager, Emerald Publishing Group, for the support rendered for this kind of a great deed. A program like this cannot happen overnight. With a great respect, I would like to thank to the all English officials from the Emerald Publishing, Gulf Medical University, and the Sabaragum University of Sri Lanka. Finally, thanks to the audience, all the senior professors, professors, senior academics, visiting faculties, researchers, industry participants, partner university representatives, research students, media presenters, including Sunday Observer and Sunday Times, for your active participation. Thank you all for making this session a great success. I convey my best wishes to everyone. Stay safe and have a great day until we meet you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. Week. Thank you so much, Professor Shanti. Thank you so very much for Great sharing to your see knowledge. All of you. put, put faces yes, to me. And thank you for next giving me the opportunity. Yes, next week we are going to have a session by Ms. Sangeeta Menon and Dr. Nakul Parameswar on how to improve article acceptance rate and publish quicker. That is from the publisher's perspective. So we'll meet up again next week, next Thursday at 12.30 p.m. And have a good week. Thank Please you. Bye-bye. Have a lovely weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.